where am I gonna break? That you're like, I've seen this a hundred times. Most people that try to skip that step and don't build the playbooks end up falling backwards on the weight of their growth. What is up, Marnie? How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing incredible. I'm uh, excited to chat. Um, just so for everybody's uh, context, why don't you give us a 30 seconds company, who you serve, what problem you solve, and how you solve it? Absolutely. I am Marnie Stockman, CEO of Lifecycle Insights. Uh, so we help IT business owners sell to execs, not techs. Cool. So IT business owners sell to execs, not techs, meaning C-level, not the dev teams or engineering teams. What, yeah, what problem do you solve for them? Yeah, so um, we, they, they get into the tactics, the technology very easily, not the sales piece, so the strategic conversation. So we help automate reports so that they get the reports that they need and we help tie that to the business pains and an assessment piece. So they can connect for the business owner, business pain, how we're gonna solve it for you. Cool. So I kind of get the problem. You you help these 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 uh, IT consultancies manage the quarterly reviews with their small business customers so that they can not only keep the customer but get new business. Absolutely. Yep. What what can I help with today? Uh so, so I've got I've got a few questions. Um my favorite is we do 10% of what we do. Um, is what 80% of what is a competitor of ours does. Uh, and I'm, I am most interested in the best way to, to market to them. So we do all of the education, the organic pieces. And I'm curious if you have a good strategy around, um, I've done Google ads, people do not search for these terms. They find other vendors in the space by, um, by asking people in their peer groups, right? So they speak to others who they would go after. So targeting them in a traditional Facebook ad or Google ad or whatever doesn't seem to work as much. So I'm curious if you have any. So I'm, I'm trying to understand it. So the problem you're trying to solve is a potential customer of yours discovering you online. Yes, particularly okay. targeted to a competitor. Okay, so you want to target your competitor's customer base. Yes. Okay. Um, why do that versus not just speak to the market and the problem they have? Uh, so we, we regularly do that and we get some good traction for sure. Okay. Uh, this, we are doing something unique to combat this one particular competitor. Um, okay, so here's a question then, because I've done this many times over the years. Um, you know, one of the strategies I teach is core targeting, which is asking the question of what other products does my ideal customer purchase? And through that process, right, the, I call it the fun, the follow and the frequent model. So on the fun side, where do they spend money on? How do I attract or get in front of that customer? Does your competitor run an event every year? They do not, they attend events. Okay. They don't run an event. Do they have a Facebook page? They do not. Okay. Do they um, have a partnership with any other companies that you're aware of? So they have, they integrate with other companies as do we. Okay. So is there, is there anything that tells you from a website that a company is using your competitor? Um, sometimes we can identify them on the client end. Um, well, I can see like for folks that we integrate with that they also integrate, but I don't know the end. But typically what you'll see sometimes if the tool has like a scheduling component to it or a contact form, you can scrape the HTML of a website to see if they use HubSpot, Shopify, your competitor's name. Does that make sense? Does your competitor have a tool, a widget that they ask their customers to install on their website? Um, do you have a tool that you ask your customers to install on their website? No. 
No. Okay. So, so I'm always looking for artifacts. I'm looking for. Oh, I'm with you. I'm intrigued. Yeah. No. And this is this is the this is where I think growth hacking truly comes from. It's not essentially marketing. People are like, oh, growth hacking is this, and I'm like, that sounds like marketing to me. Growth hacking is asking yourself what data point, artifact, characteristic is true that if I uncovered and I found a creative way to build some technology, a scraper, utility to pull that list that I would be able to create some kind of campaign, right? So if I knew they had uh, a private Facebook group and I scanned that group, I'm not saying anybody should do this, but people have done this, which is scrape all the Facebook IDs, turn it into a remarketing list and, and created ads against that. You can imagine that would be something people do, right? Um, or scrape, you know, using builtwith.com, which is a great tool to find companies that have used certain technologies to build their website. Or there's even companies out there that uh, I don't know the names of them, but I know my team uses it to find my, my sales team does this to find companies that what they do is they search the job postings of companies to see what technology they mention to figure out what companies are using what technology. Isn't that cool? So, so, so companies around the world publish their job postings and in the job posting say things like must have 15 years experience in Siebel or BEA WebLogic or Oracle data frames. And then they'll scrape that and then sell that list, you know, to people that are trying to sell the companies that have these characteristics. So that's what I'm always thinking about. Um, other strategies, again, I don't recommend these, but I'm gonna share them anyways, cause that's my job. You know, I, I work with hundreds of SaaS founders trying to build demand gen programs. Um, another strategy is to find out who used to work at that organization as a sales rep and see if they might have potentially access to other people have done this, not us, we would never do this, but you can imagine somebody could do that. And, and they would bring their book of business with them. That's another way to do it, right? Um, but typically like I'm looking for partnership connections and then I'll, and then I'll see if I can build a relationship with that partner that's more lucrative than my competitor. Um, I, I use, uh, back in the day, I used to use compete.com. There's probably some other SEO tools that will actually show me who are the largest referrals for my competitor. So I might be able to find out who, what traffic source is generating the most traffic to them and then try to build a relationship with that traffic source to send that traffic to me. That is super interesting. Uh, the interesting part is none of our competitors actually do much marketing at all. <laughs> so, so they tell us we are everywhere in the space because they actually see us out there. We just want more of that space. So yeah. So, so trying to figure out traffic, try to figure out who has the list of their customers, figure out if they're the, who's the partners with them. Like, you know, that that is competing in the space there's gray hat techniques there's there's black hat stuff um i'm i'm super ethical i don't do anything i wouldn't feel comfortable having published on the home page of the wall street journal but at the same time i'm aware of every strategy out there for demand gen so a i can protect myself against it that's also another reason to be aware of them not just stick your head in the sand but that's that's the way I would think about it. And I guess like there's some more digging for you to do to figure out where that might lie. But now you understand the principles and the framework behind it. Does that make sense? Oh, completely. And frankly, when I wrote that question for myself, I I finished it with without being gross. Like we just refused to be gross. Totally. It's one of our core values. So I'm not gonna do any of the You have a core value called don't be gross. Uh, it actually is transparent, but um, okay. <laughs> we might change it to don't be gross because, you know, our service. Don't be gross is a little bit more specific. It's like don't be evil, but a little bit broader um, meaning. Um, what did you like best about what I just shared, Marnie? What, what resonated the most with you? Well, I, for sure, the referral piece, because I think I actually know how to go about doing that. So to find what is a good referral source for them can become a good referral source to us because will be scrappy and go do that. Cool. Uh, what else can I help with? So if we are at 500,000 MRR and aim to be at 1 million MRR in six months. I'm what, assuming you mean ARR, annual oh, recurring, not monthly. ARR. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah. Yes. Cause, so cause you, I mean, if you're at that level, then we should talk about a little things. bit more fun. Yeah. <laughs> you're McLaren. Um, so, okay. Yes. ARR. 
Um, what am I not going to see coming? We're like scrapping like champs to get all of the processes in place. Where, where am I going to break that? You're like, I've seen this a hundred times or a thousand times. Yeah. I mean, in the early days, there's this level of, of scale, right? At the bottom, it's always product. You can't outgrow yourself from a bad product. So we always start with product. The next level is promotion. So if I ask you on a product level, it sounds like you feel pretty comfortable. You have a great product based on the fact that you do eight, you know, 80% of, or 10% of 80% of what somebody else does. Right? So you have a great product. So then I go to promotion, which is how do I build a demand gen engine where I can, and I'm always looking for CAC payback. That is my core metric. So where can I invest money to generate sales and do that in a period that's quick enough to cover my costs. So CAC includes marketing and sales expenses. Okay, so your marketing team, budgets, sales team, commissions, and, and truly what's called fully loaded CAC includes tooling, office space, and if you want to get even nerdier, just gross margin, not revenue, right? So you can play around what feels good, but typically I want to get for bootstrap founder CAC payback period. For all my coaching clients, I want to get them below 90 days because if I can get them below 90 days, then if you grow really quick and you don't have it below 90 days, that's where you, you're forced almost to go raise external capital just to fund your growth, right? But if you can get really creative on implementation fees or what's called setup fees, um, which I teach in my SaaS Academy program, I have this whole framework called the setup fee implementation, which... I think if you do it right for the right type of, of mid-market, you know, demo-led sales process, you should be able to be ca cash flow, uh, you know, CAC payback period within 30 to 60 days, right? Um, you know, by deferring your sales commission to an agent, collecting the cash up front, because um, really that's the game we're playing. That So that's on the promotion side, right? So and then I'll give you the third level out of the five because that's probably where you're going to run into issues after that is the process side. It's if I've got the product and I've got a demand generation and a sales process working, then it's documenting the process from a marketing, sales, and onboarding customer success point of view to then unlock the next level of growth. Most people that try to skip that step and don't build the playbooks end up falling backwards on the weight of their growth, right? And, and that's where they fire people, customers fire them, they have buggy code because they haven't taken the time to say, hey, what are our best, pro best practices when it comes to marketing? What's our best practices when it comes to sales? What's our best practices for handoffs in between departments and onboarding customers? What's our best practices for monitoring our customers and make sure that they're happy with our product? Right. And then operationally speaking, I had a client the other day that ran a report because I do this with all new co coaching clients. And uh, they found out they had a customer that hadn't paid an invoice in 17 months. But I mean, this is like, that's just a thing that they didn't have any accounts receivable process. The person that was doing the bookkeeping was so busy with just trying to do the bookkeeping, they weren't even thinking about accounts receivable. And they found out that they had dozens of customers that hadn't paid invoices a while, but the one that was the worst was 17 months. And like, try to go back to a, cu a customer and say, oh, sorry, you owe us $20,000 because we were not on top of it. They're just going to be like, I'll give you three and you should start invoicing me next month. Get your act together. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, I mean, these are the things that, to me, process is the next stage once you can get the promotion side figured out. Does that make sense, Marnie? It does. And plus side, it is what we're working on, like, around the clock. So that's what, what do you like best about that strategy? Like, what resonated the most with you? Well, I think it mainly just confirms that that is what we're spending the right time doing, right? It feels like you have to slow down a bit to document every single piece. But if we don't do it, we break in the future. Um, and and I come from a background of customer success. As a matter of fact, I wrote a book on it for managed service providers. Um, so I truly believe in the pieces you were talking about, about figuring out when they're happy, healthy, et cetera. Awesome. Cool, Marnie. With that, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate the time, the opportunity to you know, help you out a little bit. And um, I'm just grateful to uh, have you in the program and, and support you on your journey. Well, I appreciate the call. Very excited. <laughs> All right. Have an amazing rest of the day. You too. Bye-bye. Cheers.